live stream for Heritage Open Days today. We're talking about um, some objects from our collections involving creativity. So I'm Andrew Whitmarsh, I'm the D-Day Stories curator. I'm here with our curator of art, Emily Worsdale. And just to give you a quick preview of what we're going to talk about, so we'll be talking about these in more detail in just a minute, but they're all items from our collections that involve uh, creativity in different ways. So this one is a um, notebook from a course that someone did on vehicle maintenance. Then we've got uh, diagrams that Aren, a member of the Women's Royal Naval Service, used um, to help uh, train people who are learning about landing craft. Uh, some drawings sent by uh, John Jenkins, a local veteran, to his family back in Portsmouth. Um, some drawings done by a naval veteran who was on a ship off uh, Gold Beach, um, sort of recording his memories and his, his experiences. And then this log from a merchant ship from which was carrying fuel. Um, so the, the um, um, gentleman who was the, the um, captain of the ship recording his memories of his, of his, his experiences. So that's what we're going to talk about in, in just a moment. But just to introduce uh, uh, Emily. So Emily, do you want to just say a, a little bit about uh, what your job is and your, the collections you look after? Yeah, so hi, I'm Emily. I'm the curator of art uh, for Portsmouth Museums. So I look after the um, art collection, which spans fine art, decorative art and applied art, uh, which includes furniture as well as paintings and ceramics and sculpture. Um, so as Andrew said today, we're looking at um, art to do with um, D-Day and from the D-Day story. Um, and it's interesting because um, the art collection kind of spans across all of the disciplines that the museums cover, including uh, local history um, and even natural history. Um, so they, art kind of appears in places that is kind of maybe unusual and uh, not expected um, places. And, and so we're following the Heritage Open Days theme this year of uh, it's creativity unwrapped. So that's, that's why we've gone with this. Um, and we found that when we're talking about um, these objects when we're preparing for this that um, you and I come at it from slightly different angles don't we which and that will probably come out a bit as we're talking so um, naturally you're more thinking about them the uh, items as works of art and I'm thinking about them not exclusively but but mostly as sort of ev you could say evidence as what can we learn from this about um, this aspect of history what um, so um, yeah so let's we'll just have a, a quick uh, reshuffle and just pass that down to you, and then we'll look at the first item. So the first uh, <coughs> item that we're going to talk about here is this uh, notebook. Um, I'll just uh, turn it to another page in just a moment, if you want to have a, 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 a bit of a look there. So this was um, a training notebook from uh, craftsman D.W. Finney, who was in Remy, the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers in uh, May 1943, and he was it's also all, all about vehicle maintenance basically. He, um, don't ask me too much about the details of, of what exactly what they're showing. Um, I'm not being very technical, I probably don't really know quite what they are. I'll just turn to another page just so you see a, another example. Um, but you kind of get the <coughs> get the gist. So, um, this I think these would probably have been um, there, there would have been a room full of a uh, classroom full of. Uh, people um, learning whatever the course was about, and there would probably have been a diagram up on the notice on a, a blackboard rather that people would have had to copy down. Um, so they look like they demonstrate a high level of drawing, but um, they are kind of technical drawings. The class would have reproduced these, um, so you can imagine there would have been uh, textbooks um, or off of a blackboard, or um, and um, so they're a tool for learning um, to help. Uh, the people making the diagrams memorise various components. Um, you can see the use of colour coding. Um, I guess there isn't really much scope for creativity, is there? Because you can't say, oh, I don't like the way this particular component is drawn, I'm going to draw it a different way, because it needs to be accurate and represent what the, the thing really looks like. Yeah, so there isn't much room for things you might expect to find in an artwork, like um, kind of representing emotions or um, there's not really much room for artistic license which you might expect to find. Um, um, but they are, they are often quite skilled and um, you can see that the people concerned have put quite a lot of effort in probably because they had a sergeant or someone breathing down their neck to make sure they got it right because it was part of, of learning how to, um, uh, yeah, learning all the technical stuff that they, they needed. Um, and we'll move over to the next item which um, 
that's got a, a similar theme that is also about learning. Thanks. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> these are, well, this, this, we look at this larger one here. This is a, a drawing of, as you can see, perhaps a landing craft, uh, LCPR, landing craft personnel ramped. Um, and these were done by a Wren, a member of the Women's Royal Naval Service, who was on Thorny Island, a place called HMS Northney, which was a, a, a naval base actually on land where um, sailors were being trained to use landing craft. So they were starting from very much from the basics. Um, and uh, Moira Cruikshank was the, this Wren who, when she arrived, uh, her superiors realised that she had some talents for drawing. And so they would, um, they asked her to do these drawings of different landing craft. Um, so we got a range from different sorts of landing craft. I guess sort of highlighting the, the, um, the key features so you can <clears throat> see it's got um, some of the, the inside of the landing craft where, where the controls are. There's also views just slightly lower down. You can see what the hull looks like, the propellers. So obviously stuff that you, you need to know if you're operating a landing craft and to understand um, how you can beach on a beach and all those sorts of things. And then <clears throat> these were reproduced. Uh, the smaller version you see on the right is actually the same image, but that's a reproduction that was done in, in World War II. Um, we're not quite sure how they were used, but to basically to circulate around the sailors so they could, um, yeah, it's part of the, part of the, the um, learning how to um, operate these landing craft. So again, this is a, obviously there's a training and technical side to this, isn't there? Yeah, so although this wasn't Moira's intended um, role, they obviously took advantage of her apparent skill. Um, and you can see um, the use of kind of draftsmanship uh, with shading and uh, kind of the use of line and highlighting. Uh, you can see just here where the shading implies that the material of the ship um, is, uh, the craft is metal. Um, and um, other kind of materials like the rope, um, she's highlighted that to make it make the texture apparent. Um, it, I find it quite interesting because you can you might not be able to see, but the uh, drawings are actually drawn on separate pieces of paper that have been collaged onto um, this larger piece, and they're actually um, drawn on the back of a map, which you can see here. Um, so it kind of uh, highlights again the fact that this wasn't her intended role and perhaps she didn't have many materials to hand and would just use um, things that she had um, on hand to produce these and then they were obviously photographed uh, to produce these documents which are which were um, distributed um, so it wasn't essential that these drawings were all on the same piece of paper perhaps she drew them at different times different stages she would do them when she had a few minutes spare um, um, yeah, and but so and I'm assuming that she would have either chosen the angles they're at, or or been told, can you do one view that shows the underside and things like that. But the, there'd be a bit of creative choice, I guess, in, from her side in um, exactly what angle she chose. And, yeah, I suppose and, it looks it looks like um, she's chosen the angles to represent all the key components mm. again, like you mentioned, the propeller, um, and then these uh, kind of hatches or doors. The, oh, the, the ramp at the front. Yeah, yeah the which, ramp, yeah. Um, which she's shown from the side and then again here in more detail from the front so you can see um, the width of it compared to the rest of the craft. Um, and, and, then, and, and Moira uh, ha also did a, has a sketchbook which is on display at the D-Day Story so if you ever, if you visited already you might have seen that there. Um, and I think she went on to do some other things like she um, um, did a mural on a, an officer's mess later on in the war. Um, so some other, other, other things as well. Um, so then the third item that we're going to look at was a small, a small group of uh, items. Just do the quick change over. Thanks. <clears throat> so these uh, drawings in a letter were by um, John Jenkins, who was um, well known as one of our local veterans in, in Portsmouth um, until he passed away a few years ago. Um, he played a really big role at the time of the... Um, D-Day 75 commemorations in 2019 when he was one of the veterans who spoke on stage kind of summing up um, the thoughts of all, of all the veterans really and that, that was something that um, a lot of people remember. So he, he, he went over to Normandy soon after D-Day, he was in the Pioneer Corps and um, he was um, 
sent these, this letter and these drawings back to his wife and his four-year-old daughter, Diane, who was in Portsmouth. Um, and so the, the letter here, um, you can see, has a little drawing on at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> but it, so this is written to it specifically to his daughter. Um, and he actually uh, mentions, some, he says something like, I'm still chasing the German who made a hole in our roof, referring to the um, bombing um, that had happened in Portsmouth a bit earlier in the war. So there's kind of trying to relate it, I guess, to something that his, uh, his daughter had experienced. And then the two drawings, um, one of them he's obviously out in the rain and in the rain and the mud. And then the other one, he's um, sleeping in a dugout, so basically in a, a hole in the ground. But I think he, he, he seems to have struck quite a good balance, it seems to me, between giving some sort of impression of what life was like, but also doing it in a way that would come across to a, a four-year-old and wouldn't be scary, which it would quite obviously a lot of what he would have been going through would have been scary. Yeah, I think the kind of intended audience is definitely um, highlighted. Um, I personally really like the fact how he has um, kind of person personified um, things like the moon. He's given him a helmet and um, kind of added a frog here. Um, I like that how he's labelled it um, so that it's kind of, he's kind of making uh, it, it like making it aware like he's obvi obviously um, aware that he's not a professional artist that he might not be able to represent things in sketches very well so he's annotating the drawings so that his daughter can understand what he's kind of trying to portray um, other comic elements um, such as the umbrella that he's attached to his bayonet and um, other kind of uh, yeah, just kind of comic, um, fairy tale esque elements. I think are really sweet. Um, he doesn't want to scare her, but is trying to trying to persuade, per portray the situation that he's in, um, which is really nice. Um, I should have said earlier that if you've got any questions or comments, um, uh, do do uh, submit them. We'll, we'll have a look in a minute and uh, um, and answer any questions that have come up. Um, so that's the um, third of the items that we're going to look at. Um, so the, do we have, do you have a question that's come in? No. no. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll just look at the next little group. Can you pass me the, yep. that one please? <clears throat> uh, so these are some drawings by a naval veteran, uh, Robert Ray Rule. Um, he was on board the ship you can see here, the uh, HMS Empire Mace. Um, and this was one of the landing ships that carried lots of landing craft. Um, you can see on the side of the ship there's, there's several landing craft um, on, suspended from the side on the derricks and several in the water as well. Um, so he was on the ship off Gold Beach on D-Day. Um, and so this, um, so he, he did some of these drawings he did at the time, some he did a bit later, but I think a lot of them he did at the time. And a lot of them were based on apparently on his, um, what he actually experienced himself. Um, uh, some of them based on, on what he'd heard from other people. Um, and he did, we've only got three here. He'd, he'd given us quite a large um, collection um, a, a, um, relating to different aspects of his experiences. Um, so this was the... I think this one would be basically be based um, on what he himself um, saw, because this was the, the ship he would have been based on... Um, or, I think all the time when he was over in Normandy. Um, should we have a look at the, the next one? Yeah. Or did you want to say anything about this one? Uh, only really, like, it's, it, it's obvious that um, this is something very familiar to him. There's an awful lot of detail in, in the ship. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's apparent that um, this was his day-to-day -day life. Um, and, um, yeah. And, and actually, from... A sort of um, coming back to the kind of art versus evidence sort of sides that we we talked about earlier. Um, this uh, this is a nice depiction of some of um, a scene that, as you say, he'd been familiar with, and so it's quite um, he, he'd have known what the ship looked like. I mean, he wouldn't necessarily have seen it, I suppose, from this point of view that regularly, but he, you know he'd have he'd have he'd have known what the ship looked like. So it's nice as an example of. Um, what this sort of ship would have looked like when it was off Normandy. You can, see, like we were saying, see the small landing craft in the sea. It kind of gives you an idea of how the ship would operate and um, that kind of thing. 
And would these um, drawings maybe have been from diagrams that he would have studied from the ship or um, obviously it's from a perspective that, like you said, he wouldn't have seen himself <clears throat> being on the ship. So, Yeah, no, I don't think he would necessarily have had sort of diagrams as such, but he, I guess when the ship was, um, it was moored at a quayside, which would have happened occasionally, he'd have seen it from this angle, for example. Um, maybe sometimes he might have gone on to another, another um, sort of smaller boat to go to another ship or something. Um, so, um, oh, and yeah. So the next one's quite, quite different, isn't it? <clears throat> so this <clears throat> this is a scene on one of those small landing craft heading for the beach um, and you can maybe see from um, some of the, the facial expressions of the people involved can get a sense of some of the things they might be feeling there's a, a, a sort of explosion from a shell above so and they're all crouched down um, to get as much protection from being on the landing craft the, the size of the landing craft as they as they could so he, he um, Robert Ray Rule's um, job on the ship was it, he worked in the sick bay, um, so he would have um, treated um, a lot of the casualties who were the wounded who were brought back from the beaches onto this ship. So very possibly, partly this scene would be based on people who'd been in that position on that landing craft, and then they'd been wounded, and then they'd come back to him. He was sort of treating them. Um, dressing their wounds, that kind of thing, and then this might have been based partly on the sort of descriptions they got. Um, so it's quite a different scene, isn't it, Emily, from the, the last one? Yeah, so these, these um, stories that these troops would have come back and uh, told him, um, obviously very emotional, and um, they, they would have... Um, so this drawing kind of represents that because it's very um, sketchy, there's a lot of... Um, anguish in it it's from an interesting angle um so although it might not be very like factually correct um and i'm not sure whether you'd be able to um tell who some of these people were or whether they were all they would have been in the same landing craft or different ones um it kind of tells an overall story of how they might have been feeling and um, the expressions on their faces uh, the colors that have been used um which is another interesting um, point of these watercolors uh, because um, they're, they're probably there weren't so many um, color photos at the time um, and probably definitely not of this sort of um, situation um, so it, they kind of give you um, a different perspective to what you would get from photographs um, which can kind of we be seen in the other images as well and actually there's so there were people with cameras in landing craft in this position, but not, not many of them. And I think there's very few, in fact, possibly no photographs that show exactly this kind of scene um, that I remember seeing anyway. Um, probably partly because with all the tension of everything, the, if, if you're a photographer on a boat, you were probably mostly concerned with um, thinking ahead to what might be happening on the beach and not, not taking photos of, of, of the troops around you. So it is quite a... Um, it's, I think, valuable from that point of view because it's recording something that, even though he wasn't necessarily on this sort of landing craft, it's still based on um, what he'd heard from other people. Um, and, and like you said, getting those sort of emotions across because um, even if you're, re if you're reading someone's words um, in you know, the, the sort of memoir that they've written, that can, 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 to some extent, get across what it was like. But I think you definitely also gain something from some, uh, well, art like this that enables you to um, get in touch with the emotions that those people might have been feeling a bit. And he might have been using it himself as a method of kind of art therapy to um, process the emotions that were being um, piled onto him from all the pe people that he met um, coming to tell him all these stories. So it's re a really interesting piece. Mm. Uh, as I said, he, cre he created quite a lot of um, works like this um, that he, he gave us a while back, which... Um, so. I think you, you're probably right there about um, it's a way of maybe sort of processing memories or recording memories, recording things that are important to you. But, but yeah, maybe there's an element, and like the next thing we're going to talk about as well, there's maybe an element of um, kind of setting them down in, on, on paper and um, maybe kind of to some extent sort of getting them out of your system. I know for, the, um, for a lot of the veterans, the, their, obviously their memories of war were quite traumatic, and even if to start with, 
they <coughs> sort of suppress them, um, they would come out later. So I'm not saying that, that any of the people we're talking about now necessarily have those kind of memories, but um, uh, you wonder whether that might be in part of it as a way of kind of making sense of the memories. So we've got one more of his, um, his works here, haven't we? So this this one obviously shows a scene on the beaches. It's a little bit after D-Day probably, um, but you've still got some wounded being treated on the beach, for example. And you can see further back at the water's edge, there's various ships and landing craft that have come in. Um, and just generally the whole, um, uh, the, the landings in, in process. So um, very possibly based on scenes that he saw. But I think actually this, this photograph, not to take anything away from it at all, but I think this photograph, sorry, not this photograph, this, this work of art was based on a photograph um, that's uh, a, a fairly well-known photograph of one of the beaches. Um, and um, I guess that if that is the case, it's not, wouldn't be the first time that veterans have um, used kind of other sources to um, sort of support their memories and... And, and so on, because obviously with these, all of these events happening, um, uh, what people could remember, apart from anything else, wasn't necessarily, um, they couldn't necessarily remember everything, so um, anything you wanted to... Yeah, say? again, this piece to me is interesting, um, again, because of the colour, the use of colour, um, but also because of the sketch, like sketchy pencil marks, and you might be able to see in the background, particularly here, um, where he has... Um, obviously drawn the the silhouette of this figure that he's gone on, over in pen at, um, later on. I mean, he seems to have drawn it three times, and um, it's it's kind of difficult to tell um, the reasoning for that. Maybe the um, under-sketching was just getting the layout correct, or it could be um, kind of to show movement of some kind, which I, I think this image really does um, show, like, lots of things are happening. There's lots of um, scratchy marks here, uh, kind of shadows of other people which haven't been um, filled in in pen and heavier uh, paint at a later date. Um, so this, this one, um, yeah, just select, suggests that there's a lot going on and um, I think, yeah, it's really interesting. So we've had a question um, about how common it was for uh, soldiers or people in the armed forces to produce works of art during the war. Um, and actually that could have been a point we started at, I suppose, because there were... Um, some people who were official war artists, and so that was their entire job to create a, a record, um, so commissioned by the government or by the armed forces to create a record of um, paintings or drawings of, of events. And so there were quite a number that went to Normandy. Um, I think their, <clears throat> um, their works in the Imperial War Museum, and you can see quite a lot of those online, for example. Um, so it's quite interesting, actually, that even at the time, uh, it was recognised by the government, etc., that... Um, a photographic record was enough and there was something more that you could gain from uh, having artists record scenes. Um, so that's, yeah, an interesting reflection on the limits, you could say, of photography, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess we talked about with some of these, the, there's some scenes that it's a, would be very unlikely to be photographed or, um, yeah, he, like, any scene where there's great danger, for example, um, might be very difficult or you know unreasonable to expect a photographer to kind of have a, a great chance of, of losing their life just to get a photograph although some of them some of them did take those kind of risks um but um yeah there's, no, it's definitely it's not just that it's it's also clearly that there's things that you know, I, and maybe that comes back to what we were saying about the kind of um, emotions or other sort of intangible sides of, of art that you don't necessarily get in a photograph yeah i think um a piece of art can capture those elements better than a photograph um, and you can kind of merge uh, multiple scenes into one whereas a photograph uh, you, is just one millisecond of, of time. Um, an artwork could contain a kind of whole, whole day's worth of imagery um, and uh, just in one piece which kind of say, can say, say more than photographs or even an album of photographs. Um, and they, I mean, it carries on to today as well. They still have um, mm -hmm. artists going into war zones and mm -hmm. documenting. Um, and from our collection as well, um, we have Edward King who documented the bombings and 
um, in Portsmouth. So uh, it's kind of, yeah, across the board it happens. Yeah, um, that's a good example. Cause, so he was commissioned by the Lord Mayor to go around Portsmouth and paint, do paintings of the ruins. And, um, yeah, someone could have... Uh, yeah, someone could have taken photographs, but they clearly thought, as is, as is very justified, we say that it's, having a painting was added something to it. Um, and the perspective as well, like mm. um, you, you kind of, uh, yeah, you kind of have to take more time to compose it, so it's not just a quick snapshot where you might have missed something important. Mm. Okay, so let's look at the last but not least uh, item that we're talking about today. <clears throat> So this, as, as you can see on the, the cover, um, is the log of a chant. Um, so this, was, this is the work of um, Harry Etheridge, who is the captain of a merchant navy ship, uh, Chant 53. So Chant stood for Channel Tanker, um, and these were um, ships carrying fuel, um, which, so um, once the Allies land in Normandy, you need to get lots of fuel over there, um, and um, there's the Pluto, the pipeline under the ocean, is quite famous for pumping fuel across the channel as a way of speedily getting fuel over there. But that wasn't set up for quite a long time after D-Day. So before that, there were ships taking fuel across. Um, and so, so he was in, in command of one of these ships. Um, and he took it over in February 1944. And this first um, scene here represents the ship... Um, when the, when the crew took it over, and you can see they're kind of getting the ship ready and um, preparing, f sort of putting the finishing touches on. Um, he says right at the start of this <clears throat> log that um, the so he's where there's, he's written little um, sort of descriptions in. He says the log entries noted under each sketch are authentic from my journal kept on board. A degree of artist license is, has been taken on most illustrations, i.e., we weren't quite so bad as hinted. So. It's a nice combination of uh, the reality of um, what he actually experienced and also humour, which um, you can imagine um, might be in a way of, of coping with all the situation they're in. And um, I mean, being, being in a war zone in a ship carrying a huge amount of fuel, um, you'd probably have needed a sense of humour just to get by day to day, wouldn't you? People shooting at you and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the sense of humour that comes across in these images are great. Um, you can see already they haven't even left the dock yet and uh, the anchor chain has snapped. Um, the uh, lifeboat is falling into the water while it's being um, attached, man overboard. Um, people kind of desperately holding on to everything they can. Um, and then some people just sat on the side um, kind of oblivious, having looking like they're having a sandwich. Um, so, yeah, I think um, the humour is brilliant and the, the technique of these drawings are kind of reminiscent um, of kind of cartoons, well-known cartoons like Tintin and uh, Popeye. And um, you can see, like, the use of his drawing techniques that are kind of um, used in those cartoons as well. Um, and we believe that um, he probably did those a little bit after the war. Um, but uh, so at the time, he we and also it was also given to us recently. Um, we have some of the logs that he kept actually day to day where he wrote up what, what had happened to the ship. And in, in those, there's quite a few s small sketches and paintings of you know, scenes that he saw um, from the ship. But this is probably more something that he did maybe once he got home afterwards. Um, probably, you know, very possibly very soon after the war or even before the war had finished um, but not actually when he was perhaps when he was making all these these journeys to and fro because obviously it would have taken quite a bit of work and we can't show the whole of this because there's so much there's so many drawings but we're just going to show a, a couple of other scenes um, <clears throat> just to give a bit of a, a kind of flavour of what's in here um, <clears throat> so this is a, a scene just representing that these ships are quite hard to steer um, and I think he says particularly when they're loaded and <clears throat> Um, so the scene you just saw basically shows not actually, obviously not something that literally happened where he's careering from side to side and sinking ships and ramming into other ships. But I guess it's what it felt like, almost felt like might have happened if they hadn't kept control. Um, <clears throat> what One of the great things about um, this log is 
as you can see here on the right hand side you've got kind of the main image and then on the left hand side you've got a bit of text which is refers to the journal he kept at the time and then this little um, sort of sub image that's some sort of small detail relating to um, the main image so here obviously it's the um, the guy on, on the ship's wheel trying to uh, keep the ship steering in a straight line. So he was, um, uh, he apparently he was um, in the Merchant Navy before the Second World War um, and then um, serving not just on this ship but on, on other ships before and afterwards. Um, so the, I'll just go on to a, another scene a bit further on. So this one is slightly more serious. This is when they are coming back from um, from Port en Bessin on Gold Beach, uh, back to Hamble in Hampshire, just on Southampton Water, and a mine explodes um, near the ship. So that's the white splash you can see to the, the left of the page there. And he's really brilliantly, hasn't he, represented the effect on the ship with this sort of ripple effect on it. Um, yeah, again, um, also the kind of personification of, of inanimate objects um, has occurred again um, with the ship this time. You can see a big wide eye um, and the kind of beads of sweat coming off of it. And it's kind of the ripple of as if it was shuddering from um, the effects of the, um, the mine. And... Um, yeah, it's 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 really interesting, and he he's kind of um, kind of making light of the situation, which was obviously scary at the time. But this drawing, of, which um, is probably of himself um, with his fingers in his ears, kind of as if the sound was the worst part of it, um, rather than the the kind of danger that they were actually in, um, and what could have potentially happened. Um, it's, this, this book is really nice as well because of the consistency, the way the text is always on the left hand side um, with this small kind of detail of the drawing and also the limited colour palette which is mainly uh, red, white and blue um, with the black sketch marks as well. Um, so it kind of it ties every scene together although they, it, and um, adds to the fact that it was a, a diary but makes it into like a storybook um, that, yeah, he could he could uh, give to his relatives or uh, for himself to kind of recall the events in a more light-hearted way um, than perhaps his uh, journal that he took at the at the time would have um, portrayed. And he, Harry Etheridge, must have spent quite a long time planning it because it's not something. You, it's not just a series of so that you turn over to the next page and sketch something else. He must have actually planned out quite a will be on each section of pages um, and then the um, last uh, one we're going to highlight Just gonna go back. right so the, the last um, page we're going to show is this this is um, um, October I think it is October 1944 um, and shows the ship at sea and these weren't huge ships and you kind of get a sense of it almost being overwhelmed by the waves here um, and it's tempting to say that this this one doesn't didn't seem quite so funny. Maybe um, I don't know. There's so he you pointed out Emily. He started to sketch in the sort of little detail on the left, but whether he just didn't find the right quite the right um, thing to include, or just didn't end up having time to finish it. I don't know. Um, or yeah, or perhaps kind of the yeah the tone of this drawing seems slightly different to the others. Um, the ship doesn't have. Uh, eyes and it's kind of it's very a very just detailed picture of the ship um, so perhaps although the mine was obviously quite could have been a bad situation um, perhaps at the time this felt really scary um, and so that that's how he wants to remember this um, and so decided against the more jovial elements which um, he could have included and included for in the book um, further towards the beginning. Um, so we had a question. Someone asked um, if we're uh, about us collecting um, kind of creative works, works of art, um, and I suppose it's not something. So from, from the D-Day story side, because um, we're we're so we the D-Day story are part of Ports of, Ports of Museums, which is run by Ports of the City Council. Um, so we don't on the D-Day the D-Day story doesn't really sort of actively go out to collect um, art specifically. Um, 
but we're just fortunate that there's uh, a lot of a lot of people either as we've talked about either uh, created um, art at the time during the war and then they or their families later on give it to us or people have created it art after the war but sort of recording their experiences and obviously as curator of art you do <laughs> actively collect art is there any anything anything you're sort of uh, so, more particularly trying to or hoping to collect at the so moment. So the art collection, um, our policy at the moment is to collect things that strictly relate to Portsmouth, whether that be um, the artist is from Portsmouth or they worked in Portsmouth or still do work in Portsmouth or whether the work itself depicts um, uh, scenes of Portsmouth or um, has strong links and recognisable links to Portsmouth. Um, so uh, yeah, um, so we we'll collect kind of any medium, um, painting, sculpture, um, furniture, uh, and uh, we have, have kind of items of interest that we would like to collect, but um, we're open to kind of, we, we obviously don't know what's out there really, um, so we're kind of fortunate that lots of people come forward with things that they have or artists um, come forward with works of art that they would like to be in the collection and be seen by a wider public um, than maybe from their studio um so yeah and it's one of the incredible things about working in museums isn't it that that people come in and entrust us with these sort of amazing artifacts so that they can be seen by a wider range of people and be preserved for the future and so other people can come even if they're not on display people can come and see them um at other times as well um so and yeah as i say quite a, a privilege that that um, people come in and trust these items to us um so we're um, nearly wrapping up. Are there any more questions? I think we're probably um, up to date. Yeah. No. So um, thanks very much, Emily, for, for joining us. All oh, right. Answer. Cameraman Dan has a question. Someone asked that are there any artistic depictions of LCT 7074 specifically from during the war? Uh, so any uh, artistic depictions of LCT 7074, particularly during the war, um, uh, no. That I know of, um, there's don't think there's any even any uh, photographs of LCT 7074, except a couple um, on the D-Day beaches, which you probably, if you've um, visited the LC, LC, LT, LCT or um, seen our social media, etc., our website, you're probably familiar with those. But Harry Etheridge, um, who is work we just looked at, did do a number of um, sketches and paintings of LCTs. So uh, we might. Um, after this uh, live stream is closed, might be next week, but we'll show a few more examples of some of the work, some of the work here. So maybe we'll include one of those. Okay, well, thanks very much for joining us, and uh, do uh, visit um, thedelaystory.com for our website. Um, check out our social media and all those sorts of things if you want to want to find out more about the museum. Thank you.